Hello and welcome to this next episode of Faith and Reason with Father James Altman, with Elizabeth Yor and Jack Maxey. We are going to discuss again something very historic. The bishops of Ukraine have actually called the Pope to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Ukraine as well, of course, but we all know how momentous that is. We're going to be discussing that as well as the latest of what's going on in this great conflict. This is Faith and Reason. Stay tuned. Father, if we can ask you to lead off with a prayer uh, and lead off perhaps with that prayer for, uh, for Ukraine. This is from the Roman Catholic Diocese of Calgary. Let us pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of infinite mercy and goodness, with grateful hearts, we pray to you today for peace. You offer us your peace continually and constantly remind us that peacemakers are blessed for they shall be called children of God. May your voice resound in the hearts of all as you call us to follow the path of reconciliation and peace and be merciful as you are merciful. We pray to you for the people of the Ukraine who are experiencing conflicts and deaths. Bless the leaders with wisdom, vision, and perseverance needed to build together a world of justice and solidarity to break down walls of hostility and division. To you we entrust all families and pray that they may never yield to discouragement and despair, but become heralds of new hope to one another in this challenging time. May you continue to inspire all of us to oneness of heart and mind, to work generously for the common good, to respect the dignity of every person and the fundamental rights which have their origin in the image and likeness of God impressed upon every human being. Grant eternal rest to the dead and quick recovery to the wounded. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let's lead off with the most momentous news I, I, I've heard in, in decades. So the bishops of Ukraine uh, this morning on Ash Wednesday, I know most of you are seeing this on Thursday, but on Ash Wednesday, uh, the bishops of Ukraine asked the Holy Father for the consecration of Russia. Can I get, uh, any, anybody wants to react to that first, please go ahead. You know, we've always heard the question, of, well, was it really done? And, and then it was, I think ultimately uh, was sort of done by Pope St. John Paul II, um, but it seemed less along the exact formula that was requested uh, by our Blessed Mother through Sister Lucia. Perhaps it wasn't done accordingly. Now you think, well, Maybe that's not a big deal, except, you know, God told Moses to strike that rock once. He struck it twice. After 40 years of leading the people, doing everything God asked him to do, he struck the rock twice instead of once. And next thing you know, he doesn't get to go into the promised land. When God asks us to do something, we better do it exactly as he says. Uh, you know, in, in Exodus 25 to 31, as you know, we are, he commanded us a certain way to worship. And there were, there were twice in those chapters of Exodus and once in Leviticus, if a priest didn't do what God told him to do, it says he should die. So this is no small matter that it should be done. Over the past, as I said, 48 hours, I've been in discussion with several people who uh, they fall on both sides of the equation in that some say, yes, it was done. Some say no, it was not done or it wasn't done properly. Uh, and so it, you, you have to wonder why are the Ukrainian bishops now asking them to do so, asking the Pope to do so. Now this is a key, this is key, and and I I don't want to name the names, but they would be on my top ten list of credible people that I would listen to. That very specifically, Pope Francis was asked to do it, and he flatly refused. In which case, then this person said, "Well, then I will go and intercede directly with Pope Benedict." And the irony being there, of course the issue of two popes. Uh, so to this day, I don't know, as I sit here, that it was done properly. You know, we talked last week that this appears to be a spiritual battle that we're in, um, especially, you know, with everything that people have gone through in the last two years. And so I would say that this um, Ukrainian war, uh, that there's a, a silver lining or perhaps a blue lining 
in this um, tragedy, this war, that it is not only um, bringing all of us to our knees with the threat of nuclear war impending um, over all, all the world, but also it provides on this Lent an opportunity to really um, join together to have the intention that the uh, world will be consecrated by the Pope to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in the way that our mother told the Pope to do so. And um, it's clear that um, it wasn't done properly in my mind because Russia has spread the errors of communism around the world, hasn't she? And so um, this Lent on this Ash Wednesday, this beautiful gift um, from the Ukrainian Catholic bishops um, is one that must be done um, this Lent as quickly as possible. And I think everybody should write, plead, talk to their bishops, talk to their cardinals, um, and um, ask that this be done and to plead with the Pope, Pope Francis. Allegedly, he may be very ill that this be his last act to bring peace to the world, to respond to the, the prayer and the plea of Our Lady from 1917. Um, it has not yet been done. So this is to me um, on this um, audacious day of, uh, of Lent, um, of Ash Wednesday, um, is one that I think we can now all rally around on our knees and pray for. Amen to that. It was in 2017, the centenary of Fatima, that at the Rome Life Forum, Rome Life Forum was a group uh, that met in Rome every year, uh, begun actually by LifeSite News and carried forward by Voice of the Family. Um, it was uh, that 2017, he made the call for the Pope to consecrate Russia, explicitly Russia, as Our Lady demanded. And uh, just beautiful to come from a cardinal of the Catholic Church. And at the time, uh, our Bishop Athanasius Schneider was there. And of course, he wholeheartedly uh, concurred with Cardinal Burke in asking for the Pope to consecrate Russia. Um, amazing stuff. Jack, any reaction from you? I think it would be a beautiful thing, but I also think that the consecration of Russia would be something that we would see and be apparent in the streets, right? I don't think that getting a Pope as his last act to declare something such unless we begin to see it in the streets we were speaking before the show I, I wouldn't it be wonderful if we saw ukrainian citizens greeting the russian troops with icons of our mother uh, I, I would like to see more evidence actually in the streets that this is this is happening and i i think that so much as that has occurred in the last 10 days or, or two weeks much of it has been propagandist on almost every side. We, we find out that there's no mystery phantom pilot. There's no woman handing out uh, sunflower seeds, the children waving to the troops. It was from 15 years ago. There's been a concerted effort to, in my opinion, make all of this as bad as it is. And please, I'm not trying in any way to define this as anything other than a horrible act. But this is not full-scale ground warfare of the type that our grandfathers fought. This is not the devastation that came to those cities in a conventional war of a, six decades ago. And I think that we need to calm down and, and back up. I do think that there are amazing things going on inside Russia, you know, perhaps unfortunate for us, but the Orthodox Church is on an absolute resurgence. Putin had agreed earlier this year to rebuild, with the help of the church, 45 hundred churches that dated all the way back to the czarist era and lay in ruins all across the russian countryside so i do see this resurgence of faith uh, if i could plead to both the russians and the ukrainian people of all faiths that you join hands uh with our mother and and pray for each other pray for your security and your future and also that of the world it's beautiful to hear Archbishop Shevchuk, the Ukrainian Greek uh, bishop in Ukraine, uh, pl pleading not only prayers for um, you know the Ukrainians themselves, but also for the Russians. He also asked uh, people, the priests, to go into the bunkers if need be uh, to say mass for the people there, encourage the soldiers to get to confession, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just beautiful stuff coming from the faith community there. But one of the things that we have to be clear about is. Our Lady in 1917 was very, very clear. In fact, 
people should not take it from us. They should go to the Vatican's website where they list clearly what the messages were. And you'll see very clearly that in the second message, Our Lady tells the children that they've just seen hell. Then she asks for the consecration of Russia. And she said, if it's not done, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world and so on and so forth. And it talks about wars and so on. She also talks about the annihilation of various nations. Now that hasn't happened yet, but she talks about that. And here we are on the cusp of what might be even nuclear war. Um, just today, the foreign affairs minister of Russia talked about that it, it, World War III would be nuclear and uh, very destructive. But also we have this promise from Our Lady that when Russia is consecrated, there will be a period of peace given to the world. And that's why for me, it's so evident that the 1984 consecration, which John Paul wanted very much to say Russia and to consecrate Russia as Our Lady demanded or as Our Lady asked for, but his entourage refused him. It was politically incorrect to do. It might create problems for Catholics in Russia, etc., etc. So he didn't do it. He consecrated the world. And so that's just historical record. That's no posturing. That's no nothing. But what he did do was consecrate the world. And there was some acceptance of heaven by that. Sure, that's a wonderful thing to do. But what didn't happen is a period of peace being given to the world. Some people said, oh yes, after 84, there's been peace, generally peace in the world. Nonsense. Heaven would never talk about peace when there is the destruction of millions and millions and millions of innocent children around the world every single day since 1984, including 1984, and call that peace. There's no peace yet given to the world. We're still waiting for that peace. You know, when we were speaking about Ukraine and, and whether or not Russia has been consecrated, and I'm a believer that We'll see that in the streets if it's true. It's not because a, a pope declares it to be true. And, and if we want to encourage it, I think that all of us need to pray the rosary. I think it would be beautiful if we saw Ukrainian women greeting those tanks with the icons of our mother in the street. I think that we are well on the way to, to getting there. I also think it's dangerous for us to think of the Russia of today as exactly the Russia of 1917. The borders are much different. Most of Ukraine, a large portion of Poland were a part of Tsarist Russia. And, and certainly in the case of Poland and, and much of Ukraine, we know that, that they venerate our mother very dearly. So I, I think that we need to pause and, and let this all play out. I, I pray every day that, that it's not going to be as disastrous as, as it appears to be, but there's a lot of propaganda from all sides going on right now. Lots of misinformation, things that we're finding out that are not true today that were being reported around the world on Saturday. And I think we just need to take a pause. I think there's some actually much more important kind of tangential issues that are gonna be fallout from this uh, war in Ukraine that are of immediate importance. I always uh, identify with Francisco, the simplest among them. My faith is, is truly one of those who were brought to it by just the image of the Virgin de Guadalupe. So I think we need to pause. I think we need to pray. And uh, I think we need to begin to look at this from 10,000 feet and see how it's going to affect the faithful around the world going forward in the next six months, year. We definitely have our part to play. The first Saturday devotion is uh, very simple, very easy. First Saturday of the month, go to Mass, go to confession. You can actually go to confession within a week on either side because heaven's generous that way. Go to Mass, go to confession, receive Holy Communion, pray the five mysteries and the Holy Rosary. And also, one of the ones that's forgotten about, meditate for 15 minutes on the 15 mysteries of the Rosary. That's our part. So let's get it done. This is an opportunity for Catholics to step in the breach. I love, Jack, how you said, you know, it's time to step back. You know, propaganda, as we learned from the mass mandate in the last two years, really took over for, for quite some time. We have to let truth emerge. And we know that God is truth. And instead of, you know, maybe wearing the blue and yellow of Ukraine, maybe it's time to start showing, and I think it is, you know, the image of Our Lady, as you suggest, Jack. Um, during World War II in Chicago, we had this magnificent Our Lady of Sorrows Basilica, where every Friday during Lent, 
when all the men and boys and sons were over in Europe fighting World War II, there was a 20,000 to 80,000 people who would come to this basilica in Chicago every Friday for a Lady of Sorrows novena and, um, and also saying the rosary. It's that kind of public display that I think Jack and, you know, this is in this opportunity of this, you know, crisis on our board, crisis around the world is an opportunity for Catholics to now again, um, to talk about our faith, to show our faith, to show instead of um, flags that our lady um, has a message of peace for all of us. And so um, we know that the rosary will bring peace to the world. It's our strongest weapon. And so this is, this is really a momentous time for Catholics. And um, we should step up and speak out now. One of the questions burning on a lot of people's minds is about nuclear war, the specter of nuclear war, the, the possibility. I'd just like to get a read uh, from you guys about what you think. Is this just posturing? Is this never really going to happen? Uh, what's your thought? I think that there's always been the specter of nuclear war, but I think that the downside for all the participants is so great that there's really uh, no interest in going there. I think that one of the things that would make that apparent to everybody is just how disruptive this war in Ukraine that we think doesn't really affect us is going to affect us. You think we have problems with the supply chains now? There are some vital things that are produced only in Ukraine. For example, neon gas. Ukraine basically produces all of it. It's necessary for making everything from computer chips to your diner flashing light. And that's just a simple thing. Russia is the largest exporter of fertilizer in the entire world. If there's nothing that more important probably for we and our faith to show it, it is to feed the hungry of this world. Currently, we're making gasoline out of corn. And now over the last year, the price of fertilizer has gone up by 175, 200% going north. We know that the third world doesn't use fertilizer when the price gets too high. The yields begin to decline. We're looking at some really big problems in the future here that are just going to be little effects of this. And I also, for example, you see all of the actions of our government, this kind of genuflection of moral posturing with absolutely nothing behind it, right? No sacrifice, just big speeches and wrap yourself in the flag of another people without putting your neck on the line at all. This is going to affect many, many things. And this fight with Russia that we're engaging with, with words and tariffs and sanctions, funny how there's no sanction on any of the Russian oil or gas that they're exporting some of which is coming to us every single day from Russia, evil Russia. They're talking about, oh, Gazprom or Nord Stream 2 may go bankrupt. They're, they laid off all their employees yesterday. These are important things that are happening that are going to change your future. This is going to be in higher energy costs, likely higher food costs, much higher. Uh, all of these are going to be inflationary in your life. As far away as all that seems, it's going to affect your life. And it's, again, one of these chaotic situations created by government and their inability to communicate or even inability to see beyond the hedgerow. One thing that we can applaud Vladimir Putin for, in seven days, he defeated global coronavirus. It just disappeared. It's over now. You can run around with Ukrainian flags in Ottawa or anywhere you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a not so subtle reference to our deputy prime minister and also uh, minister of finance, uh, Christia Freeland, who is uh, very much connected to the World Economic Forum. Um, Liz, do you want to comment for us on that? You know, less than a week where she declared um, Christia no Freeland, as I call her, um, declared the truckers were um, acting illegally um, and had shut down and imposed emergency powers through um, the government. Um, in less than a week, she is taking to the very same streets 
protesting the invasion of Ukraine. And by the way, she, I mean, her mother's Ukraine, she's Ukraine. She may have been born in Ukraine. Um, so it was okay for her to protest the Ukraine invasion, but it was illegal for the truckers to protest the illegal mandates and the loss of freedom in their own country. So the hypocrisy and the timing is just striking. The other thing that I would warn everybody about is the new world order, which thrives and looks for opportunities to create chaos and disorder so that the world or new world order oligarchs can impose this one world government. You know, interestingly, in 2010, just to you know, remind everybody, Clinton Cash, 20 percent of our uranium, the United States uranium, which is used not only for power plants, but also for a nuclear arsenal, was sold to Russia. Um, you all you have to do is read Peter Schweitzer's book um, on chapter three, um, Clinton Cash, to understand and recall that Biden, Obama, and Clinton, um, all of whom became very rich as a result of this transfer of 20% of the United States uranium um, sent to Russia to not have a serious concern about nuclear threats. Um, this is, in, instead of wringing our hands, we need to go through our beads, pray our beads, pray our rosary, because um, it is very real. Um, it's, you know, Russia is one of the nuclear powers in the world. And so a threat like that should be taken seriously, but also, we need to know and remember that our own leaders were very involved in providing the ability to Russia to have continually uh, this 20% of our own uranium capability. By the way, uranium has been used um, for power plants, nuclear power plants, which are in fact now being all closed down because the greenies are insisting on windmills instead of clean nuclear power. So, you know, they always say that Wars um, are driven by um, oil as opposed to any other real issues in, in this day and age. It's not boundaries. It's really about oil. Um, it's, uh, it's important to take a close look at this. But also, um, I think nuclear power, nuclear energy, and nuclear threat is one that we have to take very seriously. Speaking of the New World Order, did you guys see that clip of the MP in Ukraine uh, she was on the news. She was made made it famous around the uh, around the world because she is a pretty young lady. She appears with a gun, uh, saying how she's going to defend her country. And then she's on the news and she's saying we're fighting for the new world order. Let's have a look. We have been fighting uh, Putin for the last eight years, and we had three revolutions in our country when we did not agree with what was going on with uh, the direction of where we're moving in. But right now, it's a critical time because we know that we not only fight for Ukraine, we fight for this new world order for the democratic countries. Tell me, any of you, do you think that's just a mistake on her part? She, she sort of flubbed or, or she said what she didn't mean to or what? What do you what do you make of that? I've been studying and teaching this whole concept of the new world order for decades. And and ultimately that if you understand that is the end game, then all the little events between then and and when it happens all suddenly make sense, including this little bit about the demonization of Russia. You know, in, in our day and age, we know China is he is light years ahead of Russia for being evil and the evil things that they do there. And nobody's complaining. You don't hear it on mainstream media about the Magyars and that there was three million of them being uh, in, in, in these camps and uh, the billions the NBA makes from, from China. There, nobody's mentioning China, which, by the way, is also one of the grave nuclear challenges that we face. It's all about Russia. And, you know, the thing is, now Russia would have known Putin's not stupid. Had a KGB, he knows this. He would have known that there would be a reaction to what he's doing. So there must have been, we just have to assume there must have been a very good reason for him to, uh, I'll use the words, take the chance, to do what he did by going into, into Ukraine. And, and what I've heard recently in the last couple of weeks is that there were four major bio labs in Ukraine that were... They, that they went and scooped out all the stuff before this whole thing began, like a couple weeks ago, and that, that, that Putin actually targeted those plants, which are producing these bioweapons, on his border. 
you have to assume Putin's not stupid and that he's doing this for a very good reason that we're not hearing about in the mainstream media. And uh, the mainstream media owned by the New World Order, it only makes sense that this woman in Ukraine is actually saying what she's saying, because that is in fact what, what, what we're up against. Uh, and we know this, we know this. Everybody wants to rule the world in this New World Order. They've been bragging about it since Rockefeller bragged about it in the 50s. And we know about this. So uh, this idea that, they're, that the media is trying to tell about, oh, Russia's going to start a nuclear war. No, 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 Russia's not that stupid. Uh, if they got China on the south side, they got Europe and us on the other sides, they're not that stupid, they would lose. It's not Russia that's going to start the nuclear war, it's us. But you have to remember the role that Ukraine has played in the world stage for the last 25 years, say. And the same goes for Kazakhstan. Let's connect some dots here. Both of these places were like Bacchanalian uh, fiestas for bad actors in Western intelligence, for bad actors in the Western energy sector, for bad actors generally. These were places where every dollar you ever thought of could be laundered. These are places run by oligarchs. Let's uh, look at Ukraine. You know, we've had British Petroleum has apologized for working with Putin. Of course, it took him 25 years. And they've all saying, oh, how bad and awful Russia is. Has anybody asked Solchevsky at Gazprom, the wonderful Ukrainian legitimate oil and gas company, what his feelings are about the Russian invasion? I'm pretty sure he's not going to be weeping and crying like the chairman of BP because he profits from Russia's control of Crimea, where his oil comes from. We've got to get over the kind of kabuki theater of this and look at it from a realistic standpoint. We can have mass death in this world without nuclear weapons going off. We are have the lowest global grain supplies probably in a generation. The Chinese have been stockpiling this stuff. If we lose, say, just 10% of global production of corn and grain, this can have massive impact, massive impact. We're always talking about American farmers deciding, hey, we might not plant corn this year. Maybe we'll plant some cheaper product because we can't afford all the fertilizer that it's going to be necessary to maintain the yields that we've done for 25, 30, 40 years now. Feeding this world is probably the most dangerous and complex issue that we have before us. And the supply chain surrounding the fertilizer, which I spoke of earlier, just like the supply chains of anything else, it, it, you can't just turn them on and off. And there's no elasticity to make up for Russia. We've got to start actually planning for the future. Your oil and fuel costs are going to be way up. There's no way they can't be. And uh, to think that this is not inflationary will, will be crazy. And so what have any of these people done for us? It's almost as if they're masters of this changing narrative of fear. And uh, realistically, they are not capable of keeping all the balls in the air and they're going to create problems that they didn't even envision with some of this. Real human lives are going to be lost because of it, in my opinion. One of the suggestions that's been made is that a way forward in this is for the West to ensure Russia, because Russia has concerns about NATO, uh, about NATO, uh, Ukraine joining NATO. Um, and I know that's not been um, yet done, that, that they did apply to join the EU and so on. But, you know, Russia, I guess, could in some ways be seen to have legitimate concerns that way. One of the ways forward that's been proposed is to have the West guarantee Russia that no, the Ukraine is not going to be part of NATO. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. NATO unanimously pretty much rejected Ukraine's request to join NATO. So that just happened yesterday. So that, that resolves that fear. If, if true, that was what I understood to have taken place. President Monroe, when he said, uh, we're going to take care of our hemisphere, you guys over there stay out of our hemisphere, we're going to consider it not good news. All we were trying to do was protect our borders. That was the whole Cuban Missile Crisis as well. Hey, you're getting a little too close into our neck of the woods. Well, Ukraine is right next door. It's attached to Russia. So we can see why Russia would say, well, in it kind of like analogously, we don't want Ukraine a little too closely tied to you because they're on our border. It, it makes perfect sense. Uh, so I, I don't criticize Russia for being concerned about Ukraine being involved in NATO. I mean, it makes sense to me. Similarly, 
on our border, our southern border, if you believe Trump, and I think he has the information and intelligence to do so, he said this week, 12 million illegals have crossed into the United States this year alone. As far as I'm concerned, Ukraine is a great distraction from looking at our border, just as you point out, Father. In this vice grip from the North, this totalitarian um, Canada, um, and the, the chaos that is, that is pouring in fentanyl, sex trafficking, drugs, violence into our country. It's the collapse of the United States. Ukraine and everything else is a wonderful byproduct and distraction to keep us from focusing on our own national interests. And they forced Putin to make this move to, to distract us. As I said, Putin was, he's got enough to do in his own country. So you have to ask yourself, why did he do it? Well, they forced his hand and now they're exploiting our distraction to let everything else happen. One thing that we can see is why we've been spending a trillion dollars a year to combat the paper tiger of uh, Soviet uh, armor and complete inability to run logistics on a, on a campaign that's on their border. It reveals the falsehood, the, the, which is NATO and the North Atlantic Alliance. It, it, it exposes the falsehood, which is the EU. And it exposes uh, the falsehood of this giant evil empire of Russia that at a moment's notice could have troops landing in San Diego. No, it's impossible. This is a very small economy. They do not have the ability to project force. Yes, they do have nuclear weapons, but so do quite a few other countries. So to pretend that, that this is going to be happening is foolish. Instead of digging a nuclear bunker, you know, you ought to be uh, asking, why aren't we allowed to drill in America? Why is it that every act concerning energy independence, which this country could be and was almost this time last year, why is it all being thwarted? Because at the end of the day, the fertilizer costs are high because natural gas costs are high. Because of their saber rattling, Europe's economy is probably going to collapse for another year or two. You think all this wonderful growth will continue at $6 a gallon gasoline here in the United States? No, it will not. It just will not. We need to start forcing our leadership to, to uh, answer the real questions of what are before us. And there's not imminent nuclear war with Russia. It's not even imminent war protecting Ukraine unless... Uh, crying and uh, holding up signs in your office is the same as combat. This is no different than save our girls. Remember that? Right. And, and we right. didn't save them? Right. No, we didn't save them. Oh, one last thing. I laughed when they said, oh, it's going to be brokered by the West. I think I said it on our first show. This is going to be a payoff. The EU and the United States are going to end up paying off the Ukrainian people and everyone else involved. Not the Russians, but the Russians will get their territory. They will get their objective. This will be our little piece in our time. And uh, hold on to your wallets, kids, because you're going to pay for it. You know, Jack, when you talked about Russia, it lacks a certain capacity to, to wage, like the invasion at, would you say, San Diego? You know, after the, after the fall of the wall, we discovered that it was all on paper, that Russia was not as capable uh, in waging war as, as we were led to believe, thereby enabling the military industrial complex to spend a fortune of our tax dollars, building up this uh, ability to combat whatever they said Russia had. And then, you, you know, you look at, uh, remember they had the massive, their big submarine, the Kursk, that, that kind of failed and, and blew up underground and underwater. And, and then I, it seems to me they just had another one of their big ones that they don't have many to begin with. So anyone's a loss is a big loss to their Navy. They just had another one go down. So Russia is not the military threat that, that we are being led to believe by our media. And uh, China is way beyond anything. So we never hear about that. So there's, you, when you ask the question, why? Why are they demonizing Russia? Why are they, you know, why is Pope Francis saying that China is, is, is an example of Catholic social behavior or is, is you know, one of his, one of his uh, henchman does and he doesn't correct it the question why why is all this focus on russia when we know who the real enemies are and it isn't russia it's a distraction when you consider that right now 35 percent of the natural gas supply for western europe 
comes from Russia, right? If Gazprom's project for Nord Stream 2 goes online, it goes up to about 70% for the whole. And then the guy who's selling you that gas is the existential threat that you've got to prepare your children for nuclear war about? Why does he have to go to nuclear war? He just turns that big valve. That would then lead to a, a big question, a question which for many thousands of people is is really dire. How do we get out of this? How do we stop this? Because the attacks are real. The bombing is real. The refugees are real. We're In fact, we have a, a couple of lifesighters over there right now um, who are at the Ukraine border uh, filming and watching the refugees come in, watching people streaming in, fleeing from their homes. Um, we're actually providing aid through a life funder uh, that we're doing for them. What's the best shot at getting the hostilities to end, getting the people back to their homes and to safety again? I think the best shot in all these situations is to tell the truth. By obscuring the facts, by allowing emotion to control the, the narrative and therefore control the outcome, we're playing a dangerous, dangerous game. What have we learned in this chaos of the shutdown and the mandates and the masks and the forced vaccinations? We learned that when the people take control, speak up, demand their freedom, um, not get uh, lured by propaganda, but uh, promote the truth and insist on the truth, both in the school board meetings, as well as on the streets, is that's when um, we can restore some kind of sanity. And so I would urge everybody not to get pulled in by the propaganda, but to assert freedom, sanity, truth. And this is an opportunity again for Catholics to begin to restore the culture to a Judeo-Christian ethos, to take these opportunities of when we have trucker convoys or when we have protests, is that we need to restore our country and the world to um, sanity, to truth, and to putting that babe in the womb first and foremost. Because when there's violence against the child in the womb, the most vulnerable of us, then there will be chaos and disorder in the world. We must restore our Judeo-Christian principles, but it's very hard for us as a people because first of all, there's apathy amongst the majority when only 20% of Catholics are even going to mass or, or believe in the Holy Eucharist. Kind of hard uh, for the people, for the people as a whole to do this. So you look to your leaders and how you, what are you supposed to do when you have Biden, like I said last night, promoting abortion and all sorts of crazy relationships, normalization of those crazy relationships. And the, and, the, and the whole Congress is like cheering loudly. So where are the bishops? You know, where are the Canadian bishops saying to the government, you leave those truckers alone. They were peaceful protesters. Leave those truckers alone. Where are the Canadian bishops doing this? And where are the American bishops? Where's Wilton Gregory saying, Joe Biden, how dare you? After all we've been through, you still get up at the State of the Union address and say, let's kill the babies. Right. And by the way, just waltz up to the communion rail. Well, they don't have one there. Just waltz up and I'll give you communion in the hand. Almighty God, come clean your temple, because that's the start of it all. If the, if the heads of the church are bad, the people are never going to do what we want to do. Only the few. Well, fortunately, God can take a few and multiply them. So let's us keep the faith. And that's what we can do. And we can encourage all those around us be, you know, solip solidarity amongst the few. Um, but yeah, where are the leadership? It, sorry, I, I will not ever stop criticizing their grotesque failure to lead on these issues that Liz, you just talked about. Uh, like I said, John Henry, where are the Canadian bishops criticizing the government for not for their abuse of those truckers, what they're doing to those truckers? Well, you talk about the Russian air is right there, alive and well in Ottawa. Sorry, I'm picking on your country. I love Canada. It's your leaders who are kind of, you know. We have never had a better encouragement to Think about Russia, to pray for Russia, for its conversion, and for all of our conversions. Ask your bishops. Your bishops are asking for your input now with the Synod on the Families. Why not ask them, in addition for the Latin Mass, ask them for the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart. They'll know what that means. For LifeSite News, this has been Faith and Reason.